Um, but I want to say that there are elements of this life that bring me joy, and they're simple things. They really are simple things. This picture represents most of them, right? Got to love a lounge chair. I love trees. Trees, I just love trees. And you know, that's my Grace Church coffee mug right there. Got to have coffee and a roaring fire. I say when I go up to that little bit of property in North Carolina, I set a fire and about a week later, I put it out. It is just like that is where I connect with God. And when it comes to describing God, our Heavenly Father, one of the most widely used symbols of his presence is fire. Um, there are over 500 references in the Bible about a life with faith described by fire, and 90 of those represent God's presence, his presence. And um, way back in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, Moses described this invisible yet all-powerful God in ways that people could understand. We still do the same thing today. But he described the God, and we're going to get to this in a minute, but when he described the God that delivered them from years of back-breaking, soul-sucking slavery, he described that God, for the Lord your God, is a consuming fire. Once God gives you new life, he brings you a new passion. He brings you... Um, a, a passion and a light to carry into this world that you never had before. And I pray, God, that you are experiencing that today. You know, the early followers of God resonated with this image of God as a fire. And, and when they needed direction, when they were wandering in the wilderness, God actually led them by fire in the night. And his fire friends, is supposed to be contagious, all right? It's supposed to be for you and me ignited in us, and then we spread it to others. That's how the message of Jesus Christ has been passed down through the ages, one passing the fire along to another. The Old Testament prophet Jeremiah had this fire in his bones, and I want to share with you, I mentioned this last week, that when God calls us, it doesn't mean it's a cushy job, right? And Jeremiah was given a terribly difficult job. It was to communicate some very hard and very honest truth to God's people that had strayed away from the Lord. Listen to what he says. Listen to his passion. So these messages from the Lord have made me a household joke. Here he was sharing what the Lord had told him to share. People are mocking him. They are trying to drive him away from them. They are making fun of him. And he says, but if I say I'll never mention the Lord or speak his name, his word burns like in my heart like a fire. He says, it's like a fire in my bones and I'm worn out trying to hold it in. I can't do it. I can't do it. That's the kind of fire God wants to ignite in you and I. And this fire in our bones is not meant for the prophets. It's not meant for Bible heroes. It's for every single one of us on planet Earth. He wants to put a fire in our bones so that when we leave this place and when we go out into the world that we can ignite others. God has a plan for planet Earth. His plan is that every tribe, every tongue, every people would know Jesus Christ. And if we're sitting at home on our couches and not sharing that message, how is anybody going to know? How are people going to know unless we go out there and share what God has done in us and for us? When Jesus was beginning his public ministry, his cousin John, you know him as John the Baptist, right? You've heard of John the Baptist? I need you to talk to me this morning. Y'all know John the Baptist? All right. He was a wild man. He was a wild man, and he lived out in the wilderness, and he was preaching 
that people would come to God and turn away from their sins. And he baptized people. Some people think baptism is a new thing that started with Christianity, but they were baptizing people a long time ago. And here's what happened. John is out there in the wilderness. I don't know if you've read the Bible description, but his hair was all over the place, and he wore the skin of an animal and, and just was out there preaching. And so here's what he says, and he's telling the people this. I baptize you with water for repentance. That's that turn away from sin and turn to God thing. He said, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. Read this with me. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. That announcement and Jesus' baptism launched Jesus' ministry. And, and I, all, I was thinking about this as I was writing this this week. Here's John the Baptist. He's baptizing sinners. We're all sinners. Amen? We're all sinners. He's baptizing sinners and telling them to turn, to repent. And along comes Jesus, the sinless one. He knows this guy's different by the power of the Holy Spirit. He knows Jesus is different. So this announcement and Jesus' baptism, that's why we baptize, because Jesus did it launched Jesus' ministry. Now, we know that Jesus had a horrifying mission, really, to preach for three years and then to be tortured and crucified. But we know he rose from the dead. And after he rose from the dead, he spent time with his disciples and about 500 people saw him, witnessed him. And then he said, I'm going back up to heaven. And I know his disciples were like, no, don't go. We need you. We need you so badly. Jesus says, if I don't go, you're not going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He goes, it's better for you that I go so you'll receive the Holy Spirit. Now, how would that happen? Well, a doctor named Luke wrote that when God's Spirit fell in this upper room where all the disciples were hiding... They were afraid for their lives, for, for believing in Jesus. They could be put to death right then at that time. But when they were hiding up in that room, the Holy Spirit of God fell on those people. It was like the sound of rushing wind, and it said it was like there were tongues of fire over their head. They were baptized by fire. And we know they were changed. We know they were transformed. And you know why we know? Because those people who had been paralyzed with fear were now bold and went out into the streets and proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to fast forward 1,800 years. The founder of our movement of grace, his name was John Wesley, and John was a very proper man. He was very dutiful. He was highly reverent. And he did all the right religious things. But his relationship with God was ignited when he was just walking down a street in London and the Holy Spirit hit him and he could barely put into words what had happened to him. But he described it as his heart being warmed by the presence of God. And I want to tell you, he is still in the heartwarming business. Last week in the courtyard, we heard three testimonies of God at work deep in the hearts of some dear friends, of some cherished Christ followers. And they're sitting in this room today, and I want to tell you about them. All this time, God's been working in ways that we can't see. He's always at work in ways that we can't see. And a new spirit and, and grace is ignited in the hearts of people who surrender their lives, who give their lives to God and say, do with me what you will. This baptism is a, just a sign of the transformation that's going on on the inside of them. And what a beautiful sight to behold. Wasn't it beautiful? It was so beautiful. And we get to be a part 
of the journey of transformation in people's lives. There is, in my, in my world, there is nothing better than watching the lights go on in someone's life. Whether it's in recovery ministry or in Bible study or in church or in fellowship, when the lights go on and somebody says, oh, I get it now. Isn't that the best? It's the best. I live for that. Well, in preparation for this new series, Bottom of Four, I've been praying that God would set us on fire with a fire that consumes us. And in our previous series, When at Home, we considered together how we can live out our faith in our everyday lives, including our closest relationships. I want to say this. You know when I move out in front of this, I mean business, okay? Um, my mic's giving me fits this morning. Um, here's what I want to say. When we had this whole sermon series, for the last sermon series, we talked about how home is not so much our structure, but it's the people we do life with. It's the people we have relationship with. The only thing that really matters this week is you. As long as we're safe, as long as we're united, as long as we're helping one another, that's all that matters. Those of us who were flooded two years ago and last week have firsthand experience knowing that that is all that matters. You are all that matters. So remember that this week, okay? All right. So we considered together how we can live out our faith in our everyday lives. And today we're going to start a new series building on our everyday faith by discovering how each of us can be on mission, everyday mission in our everyday ordinary lives. Do you know God has a purpose for your life? And we get caught up thinking that our purpose is what we do for a living. That is not our purpose. That's what we do for a job, and that's great. But did you know that in your job, in your home, in your relationships, God has a purpose for you? God's purpose for all of us, every single one of us, is to live by um, a surrender to Jesus, by entrusting our lives to him, by following Jesus as closely as we can. But there's more because God has a specific calling for you in your individual, ordinary life to bring light to others wherever you find yourself every day. I told my boss, and I think I might have shared this last week, I used to do home inspections for a living. And I was the only follower of Jesus in that place. And, and I used to say to myself, I am a dim bulb, but I'm in a very dark place. And a dim bulb gives off light. Amen? Amen. Be a light wherever you find yourself, whatever job whatever vocation, whatever you're doing, we can be on mission for Christ. Neil and I have been just incredibly blessed over these many years to, uh, to be able to travel, I think, to like 10 countries to share the gospel and to share recovery. And... One of the things you may not know about uh, missions at Grace Church, we meet for a year to prepare. We don't just say, hey, we're going to Africa. We meet for a year, and in that year, we study where we're going. We, um, we find out about the geography. We find out about the history. We find out about the traditions and the culture of the people so that when we go there, we can not stand out, you know, stick out like a sore th thumb. We want to we wanna be a part of. Um, this week, 
I celebrated 13 years of being the pastor here, and I came, well, thank you. <laughs> but I want to tell you, I want to tell you about a comeuppance I got, okay? Because I had this cushy gig over on the Cape, and I lived on the Cape. And I found out on a Friday that I was going to be the, the pastor here, starting on a Monday. I had like three days to get my head around that. And when I came out here, I was like, oh my God, what do I do, <laughs> right? And God said to me, when you go to the other side of the world, you pray, you study, you prepare, you get to know the people, you get to know the culture. I ate catfish for the first time in my life when I came here. <laughs> But that's when, we're, when we go to work, when we go out, he's asking us to do the same thing, right? To be where we are, exactly where we are, just shining our light. You know what? Being a little bit different than the culture, right? If your waitress brings you the pink sweetener instead of the blue, we don't make a fuss. Right? Right? We're just, we try to live differently, more kindly, more gently, more, more generously. Now, I want to say God wants to put the Holy Spirit's fire into our lives so that we can do just that. But if I'm being honest, I will tell you that I can hardly drive down Palm Beach Boulevard without Jesus right now. Okay? <laughs> The consuming fire of God can quickly become the consuming fire of impatience, which leads to anger. Yeah, you remember that guy? That's me right there. And I know I'm not alone. If it's not traffic, it's something else, right? Today we're going to look at Moses. We brought him up a few minutes ago. We're going to look at him. We're going to look at him quickly. I know we had a lot of extra stuff to talk about today, but I want to paint a picture for you. 400 years before Moses was even born, God's people had taken refuge in Egypt, and there was a king there, also known as a pharaoh, who allowed them to worship God and live in peace. But then there came a new pharaoh, and that new pharaoh didn't remember or care about the history of God's chosen people. He didn't care that Joseph had, had negotiated this place for them to live. He did not care. The scripture says there arose a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph, meaning he didn't know the history. He didn't know they were, he didn't care. And he became so afraid because there were a lot of Jewish people, he became so afraid of the Jewish people that they would rise up against him that he enslaved them. It was a bitter time of slavery, and it went on for generations, okay? And I want to tell you, this Pharaoh was so afraid he was so afraid of the generation of men that would be raised up that he declared an edict, and the edict was, and it makes me sick to even say it, that all the newborn and baby boys would be drowned in the Nile River. It's, it's sickening to even think about. Enter two Jewish people. who had a little baby, and they named him Moses. And I cannot imagine, I cannot imagine the terror and also the risk they took as they wrapped up their little baby boy, kissed him on the forehead, 
put him in a basket and trusting God put him in the river to float him away to save him from this massacre hoping and praying for their babies and then it just so happens as only God could orchestrate that the Pharaoh's daughter was down by the river on that very day the king's daughter the princess the princess gets what the princess wants and the princess wanted that little baby she took him out of the water she took him home and as only God could orchestrate when she put a call out to the community that she needed someone to nurse this baby it was Moses' own mother that got to nurse him only God could orchestrate that. So Moses, this baby who was to be born into slavery and destined for death, was raised in the king's house as a prince. But as he grew up, he knew where he came from. He knew this wasn't his home. He knew his home was with his people and his passion Flared. He wanted to do something to save his people, and it was, it was ignited when he witnessed a, a slave driver kill a slave, one of his own people, and he burned with fire, but not a holy fire, friends. He took matters into his own hands, and he murdered the slave master, and then he tried to bury the body to cover it up, but the word got out. And then the very king whose home Moses was raised in set out to kill him. Moses went on the run. He was on Egypt's most wanted. His passion was beginning to run out. His dream was dying. He ran. He started um, over in a town called Midian and in time... He got married, he had a wife, and he became a shepherd. Now, I'm going to pick this story up in Exodus, and I want you to follow along. You got the context, right? So Moses is tending the flock. They're not even his sheep. And he was there for 40 years, by the way. He's tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of the Midian. He led the flock into the wilderness, came to the Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement, and though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him, from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Don't come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And when Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. Look, this is God speaking. He said, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go to an 80-year-old man. Now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh, the most powerful man known. I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, my millions of people out of Egypt. But Moses, wouldn't you do the same thing? Protested, to, who am I? Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? 
I get it. I could definitely understand that he would protest, but he could run away from Pharaoh, but he could not run away from the call of God. The call of God was irrevocable in his life, and friends, it is irrevocable in yours too. We are called of God to do something, and he calls us in the ordinariness of life. This is the important thing for you and I to get today. If we get nothing else out of this message, this call is not for televangelists and prophets, and we're not asking you to get a tambourine and a tent and go out and save some souls. We're saying when you go to work, when you get in your Uber, when you're on an airplane, when you're in the airport, be there, be present. Know that God is with you wherever you are. Wherever you are is holy ground. God moves into those ordinary places. There's a man Pastor West was telling us about. His name was Shandell, who is the, um, the bathroom attendant in Concourse C at the Atlanta airport. And uh, some years back, God spoke to Shandell and um, called him back to this ordinary job, but in an extraordinary way. And Wes said when he walked into the bathroom, here's this man, he has a smile on his face, he is saying, God bless you to everybody who, came in, who comes in, and when he hands them a towel, he says, God is good. Wes said, Shandell handed him this towel and said, God is good. Wes said, of course, those three words, all the time, and he said, oh, a fellow believer. And Wes said, how do you do it? I have a quote. He said, a lot of people ask me why I say God is good as I'm in this bathroom, but God gave me this job. I mean, it's bad sometimes, but it's a blessing too. God put me here to bless people. This work is way more than my job. Blessing people all day and sometimes all night is what God has put me here to do. Friends, the message this morning is that wherever we are, the presence of God is with us. Wherever we are, we are standing on holy ground. There is not a place we can go that God is not there. There is not a place we can go that we aren't invited to partner with God. And I want to ask you, are you available? Are you available? I've learned in some places that if I would just sit and listen to the hearts of people, that I might ask them if I can pray for them. I mentioned last week, I, I've been asking people, I was challenged, I did it with knocking knees the first time I did it, like in a restaurant or, you know, just anywhere. Just say, hey, is there anything I can pray with you about? Don't even have to do it right there. Is there anything I can pray for you about? In 20 years of doing this, I, I, I don't think there were two, maybe three people that said no. And more often than not, people will begin to weep and say, oh, thank you. I'm asking, are you available to be used by God so that your ordinary becomes extraordinary? That's the question I want to ask you as you prepare for communion this morning. As the band comes up and we prepare for communion, are you available? Maybe this morning you just need to surrender your heart to Jesus for the first or the 50th time. I surrender every day. I, I need that daily reminder. Maybe today you need to bring to God your fears about this week or your concerns. Maybe you just need to come to him and say, Lord, I, I desperately need you right now. This table, the bread of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, is fuel for us, to strengthen us. The only thing that matters is God. The only thing that matters 
is your relationship with him. He will get you and I through anything. Anything. And he wants to strengthen us this morning with these elements. He wants to strengthen us as we come to him in prayer. He inhabits the prayers and the praise of his people. And if that's not your experience, I pray today that it begins. I want to ask the servers to come up. I pray to God that he would ignite in you a passion for him and a passion for your neighbors. So I want to ask you if you would please just quietly confess to God anything that you need to confess to him. Any sin, any place where you've fallen short, this, his body and blood were broken and shed so that you could be free from all that. So let's just take a moment of silence. Go ahead, confess your sins to the Lord, and then we'll pray. We'll receive the elements. Father, we come to you. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your sacrifice. And God, we repent of all the times that you have called us to do something and we have given you excuse after excuse after excuse not to do what we feel in our hearts and in our guts you are leading us to. Father, we know that we're not qualified, but we know that you can move in us and through us because it is, it is your work that you want to accomplish, not ours. And so, God, we come to you this morning as willing vessels to be used by you, and we pray that these elements, this bread and this juice, strengthens us for our missions in our everyday, ordinary world. God, you will make it extraordinary. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, this table is open to everybody. The bread is gluten-free. And just please come as you're led and take some time at the rail here.